I felt the story is best described as transformative and can easily be interpreted more from an overarching spiritual standpoint than just Christianity. When deciding on the pronunciation of the text, there are a number of options. Some composers prefer a modern pronunciation of the text, while others, like Benjamin Britten in his Ceremony of Carols, prefer an older medieval English pronunciation. I felt that the medieval English uh, created a more authentic re, uh, representation of the original text, so I was extremely pleased to discover that we had two English majors in the ensemble who have studied medieval Middle English, and their interpretation is what you will hear tonight. I love having smart students. It's a joy. Regarding his choice of key, Heim said, I, uh, or Heim says, I often do not predetermine the key uh, that, I, that I write a piece in. The melodies and chords in my head usually determine the key. Before setting them to music, I found myself humming many of the lines in the key of E-flat major. Therefore, that was the key I chose. However, I do think it's a good key for the text, in that E-flat evokes a sense of subtle brilliance, which can also, bring, can also bring a sense of mystery and charm. Something that I found fascinating about Joshua's compositional process was his comment to me regarding dynamics. Before starting a new line of music, he will often think about the volume he wants first. This dynamic will be the beginning of his process of setting the text to the proper mood. Word and syllabic stress are also incredibly important to Heim. As much as possible, he believes that singing a text should have similarities to the way we speak. Every verse and phrase of the music of There Is No Rose is driven by volume and text stress. For example, you can, uh, you can see in your handout that in figure one, that verse two reads, for in this rose contained was heaven and earth in the little spade. The phrase begins strong and stately when describing heaven and earth, but diminuendos to a softer dynamic as the voice is condensed into close harmony to represent little spade. Heim took particular care when in his chord choices. Each phrase of music has a target word or subject that he matched with an appropriate color or mood. In particular, he adores the seventh chord and uses them frequently throughout the work. You can see in figure two that the opening measure features a minor seventh chord on the word rose. Not only does this give a lush sonority to the key word in the phrase, but it in also immediately embodies the story of Jesus of Nazareth. That his birth is both a joyous and beautiful event, but simultaneously brings to mind the prophecy of his imminent crucifixion. Figure three shows an example of his elegant word painting when he sets the text para forma, which means in equal form. The phrase is sung three times in a beautiful and subtle way of painting the Trinity figure of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the third verse, Heim introduces a sustained G major chord as the text introduces, introduces the concept of God for the first time. He suggests that this moment should be bright and full of strength, like a blinding light. The fourth verse sets an entirely new scene. His goal was to paint the idea of angels appearing to the shepherds as they announced the birth of Jesus. The singer begins with a startling forte unison as a reflection of the shepherd's fear of the, of the angel Gabriel before continuing with the exuberant Gloria text. James Bishop has undertaken the task of providing choruses uh, with arrangements of numerous art songs that were previously only available to soloists. His goal is to provide educators with the opportunity to make curricular connections between the private voice studio and the choral classroom. One of the most amazing attributes in art song is the connection between the voice and piano. At the height of the romantic era, the romantic era and art song, the piano was no longer subservient to the voice. The piano played an equal part in expressing the story, both emotionally and pictorially. The, um, when I received Bishop's arrangement of Robert Schumann's Dictums, 
I was intrigued by the idea of having the ladies in the glee club experience this connection. We used this opportunity to work with our wonderful collaborative pianist, Brian Locke, uh, in a genre of music with which he is intimately familiar. Spending years as a collaborative pianist for singers, he has become a bit of an expert in Schumann's repertoire and the uh, relationship that can be attained between the voice and the piano. We spent time discerning, determining how each phrase should, uh, should be, uh, how each section should be phrased, uh, especially focusing on rubato, which is the pushing and pulling of the tempo in order to fully express the text. We had the ladies practice without a conductor at times so that they could focus on how their melody interacted with Brian's. And in doing so, the singers learned to feel, truly connect with the pianist and embrace the, a relationship that is a key element in our song. Now, rather than focus on the formal analysis of this work, I would like to discuss the process of how I taught the song. Being part of an effective teacher and conductor is learning how to introduce new material. With some songs, you can hand it up, say it through once, and the singers immediately fall in love with it. I knew when choosing this piece that the ensemble had a previous aversion to German text because they can often be difficult to memorize and the constant consonants are extremely percussive. Knowing their predisposition to the perceived, perceived difficulty, I decided to be sneaky and trick them. So what I did, uh, one, of the, one of the most important aspects of being an effective teacher is preparatory planning and your delivery. In credential classes, a concept they discuss is how individuals process new material. Research has shown that people learn new concepts faster and more efficiently when they have previous knowledge or an emotional connection that they can reference to this new material. It gives context and relevance to the new data, and it help also helps the process of moving information from short-term memory to long-term storage. Before even looking at the piece, I told the ladies that I was going to tell them a story, one of the greatest love stories of all time. The moment I mentioned love, I had the majority of them waiting with bated breath. From there, I talked of the epic love story between the composer Robert Schumann and the, love, and the woman he adored and married, Clara Meek. How he fought for years until they were finally allowed to wed. How they loved each other passionately throughout their marriage. How Clara remained faithful and true to the memory of her husband even after his untimely death. And how this song was part of the set that Robert wrote for Clara as a wedding present to express his unmeasurable love for her. By the time I was finished, I could have given them a calculus problem and they would have loved it. By giving the singers something to connect with, uh, with this new material on, on an emotional and contextual level, made it easier for the ladies to process and retain the new information. The end result is a passionate and exuberant choral presentation of one of the world's greatest art songs. Cassiopeia by Timothy Cash was commissioned in it was is the commissioned work for 2013 by the Consortium of Women's Choirs led by Dr. Dewey Skadden and Christine Howell. The text is a stunning poem by the American writer Julia Clatt Singer. The story opens with a household scene. My sister watches as I rinse and dry. Looking out the window, all I can see is in the scene behind me. Table now clear, our mother sitting in a chair, hands like small birds fluttering in her lap. As the poem continues, we discover that the mother is dying of cancer. In order to comfort her two daughters, she takes them outside and points to the constellation Cassiopeia and the archer. These stars have been a constant in their lives from the day of their birth and will continue to be a source of foundation and comfort to them after she is gone. What I love most about Julia's poem is how it brings elegance to the ordinary, everyday occurrences. 
washing dishes, the light, the lamplight reflecting off a wooden table. Takash embodies this elegant simplicity in his writing style. The three characters present in the poem are mirrored by the three voices. As in any relationship, at times they support one another, and at other times they go off on their own. One of the first thing I, uh, things that I noticed about the opening section of the composition was how many first inversion triads it possessed. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this term, it means that the foundation note, the note on which the chord is built, is not in the lowest voice. What this creates is a sonority that sounds unstable and a bit uneasy. <coughs> For those who have lived with a loved one who is dying, this is a familiar, this is a familiar emotion. The, the feeling that nothing will ever be grounded. It is not until we begin singing about the constellations that Takash uses frequent root position triads. When I asked him if this was his intention, Takash indicated that he didn't initially intend to set the text this way, but after living with it for a while, those feelings surfaced. And as we reach the climax of the piece, the stars become our grounding, foundation and our grounding. These stars will always be there and are in a way a representation of the mother triumphing over her mortality. Technically speaking, the work is in a five-part rondo form. A rondo form means that the opening material returns. If you look at your handout, you will see that we have an A section, B, A prime, C, and A double prime. The A section is a wordless introduction. The B section sets the opening scene of the household and begins the inner monologue of one of the daughters. The A section returns and leads into, the, into section C, where we learn that the mother is battling cancer, followed by a final return of the A section. Let us look further in depth at, the diff at these different sections. The A material can be seen in two different ways. One, it can be looked at as the pain constantly returning as the women go about their everyday chores. But it can also be seen as the process of having to return to everyday life and activities after we experience these bouts of despair. The section evokes a gentle, soothing melody that a girl might go about the house humming as she does her chores. For those who have experienced loss or a traumatic event, we know these feelings well. We will be going along our everyday lives, complete, uh, completing everyday tasks, and then out of nowhere, the reality of the situation hits. These painful moments seize us and take hold until we can work through them and return to the land of a functional human being. When asked his opinion, Takash stated that he agrees with both ideas. When someone is overwhelmed with emotions, they often just need a minute to clear their mind. And this section allows the characters to regroup. The constellations are a way for the mother to help her children focus on something greater than themselves. Upon further reflection, Takash realized that this tends to be a theme in a lot of his pieces, the act of taking on mortality and tying it to something universal and timeless. It amazes him, and is a concept that he himself is still trying to understand. Although he does not subscribe to any one particular religion, Takash is spiritual and appreciates how religion has icons that we can rely and lean upon in times of trial. He himself finds his comfort in nature, science, and complex systems, and enjoys exploring that in his music. The scene in the poem is a reflection of day of the life of a per one particular family, but on a grand scale, it could be any one of us going through this. His ultimate goal was to take an everyday event and make it magical, to elevate the listener from the actual to the possible by taking us on a journey of one family's search for something to believe in that is greater than themselves, something to give them strength and hope. This is a theme that every one of us can relate to. Tonight's concert is going to be filled with a palpable love of music, art, and poetry. 
Our focus is on the future of choral music over the next 100 years, and what an exciting 100 years it will be. The Women's Glee Club will be joined by three other ensembles tonight, two of the Ann Arbor Youth Chorale Ensemble and the Huron High School Advanced Women's Choir. This stage will be a living reflection of the future of choral music. The singers have spent two months preparing for tonight's performance, and we hope you will enjoy it as much as we do. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> 